The Core 110F is a perfect solution for a lot of small installations, especially small meeting rooms. So, in anticipation of this use, the new versions of QSys Designer software will come preloaded with sample designs geared towards different conferencing scenarios. In this video, we're going to walk through a simple analog conference room design together. Before we dive in, be aware that there's nothing special about this design. There are no tricks or fancy Lua coding. It's simply a good start that saves you the time of building it yourself. You could use it exactly as it is, or you could change it as much as you want. We're going to show you how this default design works, as well as how to customize it for your own installation. Remember, by no means does your design have to match ours. In fact, that would be pretty creepy. You can use this design as a reference, or you could just throw it out entirely. It's up to you. We are, however, presenting these components in their best practices scenario, and we'll explain why we built things the way we did throughout the tutorial. One last thing. If you've been watching our other training videos, you know that we like to keep these videos pretty short and easy to watch. But there's no way around it. This video is going to be on the long and boring end of the spectrum. So to keep you alert, we're going to randomly insert Cusis-based dinosaur puns. Cusisaurus! So yeah, yeah, that just happened. You should start off by finding the default designs on your computer that are installed along with the Cusis Designer software. Go to your user's Documents folder and open the QSC Audio folder. There will be another folder labeled QSIS Designer 5.0 where you'll find these default designs. You'll notice that we've provided you a few different options, a VoIP version that uses a soft phone and an analog version that uses POTS. Go ahead and double click the POTS file since we'll be working on a POTS line. I've been working on my new POTS line at home. It's a new series of terracotta urns. Nope. We're talking about plain old telephone service, abbreviated to POTS. Triceratops. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is to rename your core to match the core in your installation. If your computer is connected to the same network as this core, you can select Tools, Show QSIS Configurator, to get a list of all QSIS devices on your network. You can click on a device to view its properties, including its IP address and subnet mask configuration. At the top, you'll see the core's name. If you'd like to change the name of your core, just type it in the box and click Update Settings. In fact, you can verify this by pressing the ID button, and your device's screen will display its name. Whether or not you renamed your core, you'll need to know its name in order to direct your design to use this core. Go to your inventory panel and select the core, then go to its properties panel and enter your core's name in the name field. Stegacorus. Remember, the naming properties are case sensitive, so the easiest way to ensure that you don't make a mistake is to just copy the name directly from configurator and paste it into the core's property field. Now, all you have to do is Push your design to your core by pressing F5 or selecting Save to Core and Run, and you should be in business. Let's go to the main schematic page to look at this design. You can see all of the core's inputs in the orange box on the left, which flow through this middle blue box for signal processing and mixing, and are then delivered to the outputs in the green box on the right. We've done this to keep you organized. You'll notice that some paths are using both signal names and traditional wiring. We like the traditional wiring because it's easy to see how the path flows from left to right. And we're using the signal names to send these channels to the meters testing page for monitoring purposes. The added benefit is that it lets us label our channels to make the design even easier to follow. And we have a thing for color coding, as you can see. So we customize those as well. Again, you can do what you like. The inputs and outputs are all core components taken from the inventory panel and incorporated into the schematic. The Core 110F has eight mic line inputs, eight line outputs, and eight flex channels that can be configured as either inputs or outputs. Tyrannosaurus Flex! As you can see, the default design uses all eight channels of the mic line in component. If you double-click this component, you'll notice that phantom power has been pre-activated for each channel because most conference microphones will need it. 
Four of the flex channels have been configured as inputs for a Blu-ray player and another aux audio input. However, if your installation needs a different number of inputs and outputs, you can redistribute these flex channels here at the top of their control panels. Remember that if you activate a channel in one of these control panels, it will become deactivated in the other control panel. Finally, the telephone audio from the onboard POTS line enters, as well as the USB input audio. If you're set up in the room, this is also a good time to begin gain staging your inputs. The preamp sensitivity and gain have been set to zero for each of these inputs, which is a pretty safe start to allow for short bursts of louder inputs without clipping. Make sure you set your levels using an average distance from your speaking position, as well as an average voice volume, taking into account that you might have some soft talkers. Or you might have some loud talkers. Giving the QSYS Acoustic Echo Canceller a strong, clear signal is crucial to achieving a clean conference call. So take your time at this step, because if an issue arises later on, it might be due to improper gain staging. If you navigate to the meters testing page, you can see a bird's eye view of all of your input levels and make individual adjustments accordingly. All of the microphones enter this eight channel acoustic echo canceller, which is the first part of the processing and mixing section of our design. If you're interested in an in-depth walkthrough of how our AEC works, you can watch our quick start video on the subject. But for now, think of it this way. These microphones receive the audio of the human speaking into them, as well as the audio coming from the room's loudspeakers that contains the person on the other side of the phone call. That extra audio has to be deleted from the microphone channel, or else the far end caller is going to hear his or her own voice echoed back to them a half second later, which is very annoying. So the acoustic echo canceller analyzes the audio in its reference pin and deletes that from each of the microphone channels. In just a bit, we'll look at exactly what we're using as this AEC reference signal. Each of the microphones then goes through this channel group component. The channel group is a convenient way to apply a single set of EQ changes to multiple signal paths simultaneously. If you open its control panel, you'll see that it's applying a high pass filter and a parametric equalizer to each channel. We have it preset to roll off at around 120 Hertz to cancel out low end environmental noise. We also have an unconfigured parametric EQ that you will want to tailor for your microphones for optimal use within your environment. Every channel in the channel group starts off active, which means that when you adjust these filters, the changes will be applied to all eight channels. If you want to make selective changes to specific channels, just change your desired channels and your changes will only be applied to the ones that are highlighted. Be aware that this component is not a mixer, so each output contains only its corresponding input audio along with the applied signal processing. Once the channels have been processed, they enter our gating automatic mic mixer. This component gates microphone channels open or closed, manages the number of microphones that are open at a time, and regulates the attenuation of these channels as more open. For a complete walkthrough of this component, check out our video on automatic mixers in the QSYS Level 1 training. This mixer also sums eight microphones into one channel that is then delivered to the matrix mixer. Before we get to these two matrix mixers, let's quickly go over the rest of the input processing coming in from our flex channels, POTS, and USB connection. You'll notice that the two stereo feeds from our Blu-ray and aux inputs lead into stereo parametric equalizers that you should tune specifically for these devices, and then into stereo gain blocks. Stereodactyl. We have a similar scenario for our POTS and USB lines. The high-pass filters are configured for low-end roll-off, the parametric EQs are for device tuning, and gain blocks at the end. All of these feed into the 5x8 matrix mixer. This mixer handles the routing of every input to every output. Aside from the mixed down microphone channel, you can see that it receives the POTS audio, USB audio, and the two stereo feeds from our flex inputs. Using the matrix mixer's control panel, you can mix the amount of each of these inputs present in each of the output channels. In this default design, the first four outputs go to four of the core's committed line-out channels, 
there's an output for pots out and USB out, then two stereo outputs go to the four remaining flex channels, which have been configured as output channels. Each of these output paths have an additional parametric equalizer and gain block if needed. Now let's look at this second matrix mixer, which is nearly identical to the first one, except that it does not receive the conference microphones, and its only output is the AEC reference signal we spoke about earlier. This means that the AEC components will remove all of the audio from the microphones, except for the intended human voices. Now this could have been accomplished within this first matrix mixer, but by putting it into a separate component, we've made it more difficult for someone to accidentally disrupt this critical reference mix. Here at the bottom of the schematic are some controls over your POTS line, including a keypad to input a telephone number, which you could also type in manually using the dial string field, a progress bar, a button to connect, disconnect, or enter the do not disturb mode. There's also a local contact list of names that you can input using the administrator tool. Just a reminder, if you're running QSys Designer 8.0 or higher, the contacts feature has moved to the core manager, which is only available when you're actually running on a core. So you won't be able to emulate this without the hardware, but its functionality is still the same. All right, back to it. Simply go to the contacts tab and press the plus button to create a new local contact list. Then, you can select which book you'd like to edit and add your contacts individually to the list to get saved to your local QSIS design. Or, link them using an LDAP server on your network for a more dynamically managed contact list. Full loss LDAPter! Wow, that was, that was a good one. There are a few other schematic pages that you may find useful. The status page shows the status block of the core and the POTS connection to help you diagnose any potential issues. The meters testing page, as we've already seen, gives you RMS meters. Meters? No, meters for every input and output channel, as well as some basic test and measurement tools to help troubleshoot your system. All that's left is the user control interface, which has been designed for a TSC7 touchscreen device which provides your end user with access to the POTS connection controls and contact lists, as well as gain control over the outputs. Like everything else in this design, don't be shy about customizing this dialer to suit your needs. Just remember that this UCI was built in layers, so if you'd like to change an element, you'll need to first select the layer where the element is located. We've been saying throughout the video that you are free to make any changes that you want to suit your needs. Case in point, Fake Hotel is putting in a new conference room with the need to integrate 10 tabletop microphone inputs, only one set of stereo inputs from a Blu-ray player, one USB I.O. for a PC to be used as a soft codec for web conferencing, two zones of ceiling speakers, and a POTS line for voice conferencing. It sounds like the default design is already set up to handle most of this, but we need to increase the number of microphones to 10 instead of 8. So, how would you go about incorporating this into your design? First, I would start off by removing the aux input blocks that you're not using. So, delete the stereo parametric and stereo gain blocks from your design. That will free up two additional flex channels for your microphones. Next, add two additional channels to the AEC component in its properties and wire the new mic line flex channels into the AEC components. We'll also increase the channel count for our channel group components and the gating automatic mixer. Now we can simply wire them up. Now there is one final thing to think about when editing this design. It's incredibly simple, but also very important. It's probably the most common mistake people make, and there's nothing more embarrassing than calling into our emergency QSIS hotline for something like this. Here it is. Double click your matrix mixer and pay attention to the cross point knobs. By default, these are all set to negative 100 decibels, which won't pass any audio along. If you want to route an input to an output, be sure to adjust these knobs accordingly. For instance, I want all four of my line out channels to carry the telephone audio and the USB audio on inputs two and three. 
So I'm going to change these knobs to let them pass audio. I'd recommend setting them to zero decibels for now, and then you can make any more adjustments later when your system is live. If you're moving on to take the level one certification exam, don't forget to adjust these cross point knobs as you change the design. And that's the entire design. As we mentioned earlier, this is designed for a conference room microphone using a POTS line. If you have any other demands of your flex channels, or you need to incorporate a soft phone with VoIP instead of a POTS line, you'll want to use or customize the VoIP version of this default conference design. And don't forget, you can add or remove as much as you want, reorganize and relabel objects, customize the UCI, it's entirely up to you. Designing a system is an art, so if you don't like the way that we built any part of this, feel free to do it your own way. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.